Hi, my name is George Sachs. I'm a clinical psychologist in Manhattan specializing in ADHD. And this is the Adult ADD Holistic Summit. I'm very happy uh, to have Evan Kirstein here uh, on uh, the summit today. Uh, Evan is an ADD coach in uh, Manhattan and elsewhere. And today he's going to talk about a very important topic, uh, ADHD and shame. And I think this is uh, often um, underreported and not the focus of work with coaches or therapists uh, because of the nature of shame and how um, difficult it is for people to share. So Evan, give us a little background about yourself and then uh, tell us what your, your work is like with, with people with ADHD and helping them overcome shame. Okay. So I was diagnosed early with ADD and it's been a topic of my life, what's wrong with Evan? You know, it, it's been a balancing act of trying to always overcome my ADHD and I've, I've taken a, a good study at it since I was young and got a degree in psychology because you kind of want to know what's wrong with yourself and be, became a teacher and as an educator was able to help others with disabilities. So I was a special ed teacher and a general ed teacher. And I moved on to coaching, knowing that this is something that I would love to do at this level. It's an exciting field for me. And now I work with teens, adults, professionals, parents with ADHD. And I, I try to support people that are stuck where you wouldn't normally find a, a, a linear stuck. And that usually has to do with their feelings. And they feel stuck. They feel that they don't have a way out and that they're always going to be this way. And, and I describe the ADD feeling of over reoccurring mistakes. And I think that that's developed since you're young. We, we realize that we had ADHD by reoccurring mistakes. And people say either it's your homework or you're in right field at, at a baseball game and you're, you're, you're picking daisies. And they realize that your inattentiveness uh, is, is a problem. And we have learned behaviors and we have learned that this is us. Whether it is something that we've done since, or, or since we were diagnosed or we weren't diagnosed and we label it as our personality. And since we label it as something, it's not one guilty thing. It's things that we are guilty of our span of life. And during that time, we have a, you know, this idea that we didn't do a bad thing or we're not, or we do bad things we're bad at. So you common, commonly hear people say, I am bad at math, at directions. I'm bad at relationships. I, I don't understand things. And that is a infinite. And it's not just infinite in the past. They, they decided that it's infinite in the future. And what I'd like to help people realize is how to pause that and to really break up the differences between guilt over one item and shame, the feeling that you're alone and that this, this is your personality. I think that's really uh, important what you said that, you know, developmentally for a, a child, there are certain ages that are very important when we have to, it's very important to feel success. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's usually around seven to, you know, well, starting at seven, uh, but it really important seven through 15 or, and I think with ADD, uh, ADHD, especially if it's undiagnosed, like you said, it's, it's all about, well, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at this. So what am I good at? And if there's nothing you can fill in the blank, um, you know, that's where the shame really starts to develop. Mm -hmm. And that's why I encourage kids with parents to really help their child with ADHD find one thing that they can excel at. It doesn't matter whether it's fencing or robotics or whatever it is, if they can just hold on to that one thing of, that they're really good at, then they'll be able to get through those difficult years. Um, but tell us what you see in some of your clients now as adults and how that shame has manifested. Oh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a 
big wall uh, is, the wall of China. It is long, it is tall, and our clients don't always recognize it, and they could be triggered to put up defense mechanisms. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's how I find that somebody has a shame is either they are a perfectionist and they don't want anyone to see how hard they're working or they are withdrawn. They, uh, they exhibit rage, they exhibit uh, it, 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 exhibitionism where, where, where they, they say, don't, don't confront me about this issue. And they want to hide it so well. It's kind of a law of polarity where someone is, you know, buying a bigger car because they're small and they're trying to show how, how you know, functional they are or hide their dysfunctions. Uh, so I see it when a client says they're stuck, but all these things uh, are present in their life that, that usually they can get over. They've gotten over this and they... they they don't know how to deal with their boss and their boss doesn't know that they have ADD. Their spouse doesn't know exactly what ADHD is and they, they have to confront somebody about it. So I think, uh, let me jump in here. I think it's interesting that you said about the polarities because I think that's absolutely true with the clients I see in that the shame is it's difficult. Often you'll see like the hang dog Eeyore type shame, mm -hmm which uh, also can be comorbid with depression. But you'll, you'll see what a lot of times what you just said, which is this kind of grandiosity narcissism, which I think is the flip side of shame. So whenever you see that, for example, in our president, there's <laughs> grandiosity and, and narcissism, but- Arrogance, denial. <laughs> I never say I hate the guy because I have tremendous empathy for him knowing that, um, deep down there's enormous untouched and unrecognized shame there has to be because as you said it's the flip side of um narcissism mm. so yeah i agree with that and he seems to be invulnerable yeah <laughs> that, that, so that's what do you do with the with these uh clients that come in and they're uh untouchable you can't reach them or they they're not aware of or don't acknowledge the shame. That's, that's where we work on vulnerability. And this is hard because it, they often don't want to see themselves as vulnerable. They think it as a weakness. And since young, I, you know, I didn't have an easy childhood. I realized that it is a strength. Uh, and, and I tell a lot of clients, no matter how afraid you are, of something, it, it, it's kind of like you're here and your fear is up here, this is your bravery. And that's what bravery is, it's a space in between being afraid and the action. And it, the longer it gets, the more brave you are. And that's the vulnerable part of you. And working on it starts off with, start compartmentalizing it, saying what it is and what it isn't. What are the facts, what are the opinions? What are other people's opinions? How do you know their opinions? How can you trust your opinion over somebody else's? And it, starting to separate it out and look objectively so that they aren't saying, you know, this is always the case. And I, I, that I'm the victim again. And that they always pick on me for some reason. And it takes a lot of authenticity to start something to, to forgive yourself. Uh, it, because it, in all in all, they made the mistake and they have to have this ownership over it. Even I, I give them statements to start off with when they're in public and they're talking with a spouse or even a boss, starting with, I was afraid that. I did this action and I was afraid that. And then starting there and really digging in and saying something that is vulnerable. And you, you, you realize each other's perspective here and it, you get to have a better conversation about it but i really believe it starts with that self-forgiveness in saying that this is one item how to learn from it how to leverage it and yeah i think yeah. That if, if a client or, or one of your clients could say i was afraid that i mean that's high level vulnerability in the sense of um 
it's almost like a bridge one has to cross to to get to vulnerability because there's a a fear that the other person won't uh, accept them or will uh, look down on them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That risk. So oh, that you, risk. How do you get them to uh, begin to think about vulnerability and and opening up at least with you? The the discussion is largely about the risk because they have an infinite risk. What if this person always sees me this way? What if I can't protect myself? What if they see me as weak? Uh, and admitting a fault to me feels stronger than hiding a fault. I, I, I look at one of the best comedians, Will Ferrell, and in GQ, it, the, the, the funny part about that polarity is, you know, like everybody knows that he's insecure in a movie or that he's, he's not smart in a movie. How? Because he tries to act the opposite. He tries to hide being dumb. So I read this in an interview. I was like, that's it. That's Trump. That's it. That's, that's the guys that, you know, that he's portraying. He's portraying a, you know, trying to be over smart. And you can tell that he's not. And, you know, you don't have to necessarily come out as ADD to your boss to overcome some of the symptoms of your ADD. They might already know. They, they've worked with you long enough and they see this happening enough that you can start by digging in and telling them how you work best, what you're proud of, what would inspire you, how they can help you, and use practical measures at, at the workspace for avoiding distraction, having some days working from home and some days you know, having kind of that novelty space. Um, being able to take a project on their own. So when we talk about being vulnerable, it, it is a measure over taking a risk. And I want them to push a positive thing rather than always, not always you know, develop a negative defense against it. Although that's mainly where we see it. Uh, but asking for help is a vulnerable portion of, of the workspace, and I don't see many people doing this. And you discussed earlier, especially men. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's the directions, you know, I stigma. Think. We don't ask for directions. And either, you know, I'm not good at directions, or excuse me, I have a challenge with directions. <laughs> yeah, there's a famous story about a Korean airline there uh, that crashed because the captain uh, was doing something wrong and, the, and uh, wouldn't ask for help and the mm. co-pilot who was junior wouldn't uh, call him on it. So, mm. uh, I mean, that's part of the Korean culture as well, but still um, you could see the consequences of, you know, maintaining this facade. Um, so for me in being vulnerable, uh, it was an unfamiliar process, but once I realized that other people responded positively to vulnerability, you know, then I could step into that more. Mm. Um, I suppose that's what you do with your clients is you, you uh, respond positively to their vulnerability, particularly Absolutely. men, right? Absolutely. And I give it myself. I, I, I try to be an example of this and it, you got to, you got to, you know, do what you preach. And that really opens up my client when I tell them something. And it, I tell them something that's current. I don't just stick with one thing. And it, it's amazing what I go through when I have to find something. And sometimes it's in between them and I, and they realize that this is a truth. This is authentic. What would be an example of that? Uh, you ever have a fight with your wife? Yeah, well, tell <laughs> me about that. <laughs> We're not in therapy now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that's that's an example. Like I, I would bring something up that is personal. I, I, I have, you know, the, the reason why I think I'm good at coaching is not being is because I'm not judgmental, and that I've had a hard life and I've made mistakes, and I pick out those mistakes. Whether I'm on the train and I made a mistake with like a homeless guy and I had to apologize to him. And it, you know, it, it took me to saying, I need to be humble enough to, to live what, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. Well, now I'm curious, what was the, uh, what happened? Oh, all right. I, so, so I bumped this guy and it was because I was on my phone and they go, oh, I gotta get off the train. And I, I, I like, I jumped in front of him as he was collecting cash. 
and he shouldered me really hard. He, he, he got back at me, he turned around and shouldered me. And then I got aggressive. The, 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 the monkey mind started spinning and grabbing everything. And I told him to come off the train and talk to me. And if, if he was man enough kind of thing. And then he went on to his other side of the train. He went to the next thing. He's yelling back. He's like, hey, you bumped me. And then I, I went, all right. Hey, man, I'm sorry. My bad. And then he, his shoulders went down. He's like, all right, cool. And then he went back inside. And th- th- I was like, all right, that, that totally, it flipped real quick. I flipped it. I didn't have to react the way that you're supposed to react. I didn't have to play a game that I didn't want to play. I could react the way that I chose. I love that story because um, if you only have one tool, you know, a hammer, and then you, you, know, you may react with a hammer to that situation and get in real trouble. Mm. Uh, but vulnerability is another tool which you obviously use there. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I would imagine it's helpful in your relationships in your house and in your work. Um, so yeah, let's review here. People with uh, ADHD because of mess ups, screw ups, spills, rejection, being fired from jobs, mm. uh, which I have been uh, until mm. I found my, my true calling here, you know, mm. feel like, right, I'm not good at that. And it's not, uh, I didn't have a diagnosis till I was 30 in my thirties. So I spent much of my yeah, childhood teenage years and young adult feeling I just wasn't good at this. Wow. What am I good at? And with that comes, you know, the inevitable shame. I call it the shame sandwich is shame, anger, shame. Uh, uh, so you, you use the word rage, which I think is probably more appropriate. Um, I, I call it uh, shame DHD. Oh, okay. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a really big component of ADHD and not, uh, on any kind of diagnostic manual, but it's it's um, really wonderful that you're you're working with it and helping clients see that they can be vulnerable and powerful mm. um, and safe. <laughs> I, I mean, being vulnerable myself, I've I've gotten into some trouble um, defending my ego because mm. of the shame, you know, underneath and. Um, you know, we can avoid all that by by expressing our weaknesses and being vulnerable um, and open with others because it is power. And often, often it is it is the glue of connection. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that vulnerability, uh, it, it wipes out the shame because you have somebody listening. Uh, we feel alone with shame, but we have a tribe of people that can help us say, we're not alone. I, I laugh with people. I'm, I'm on the board of an ADHD coaching organization and we love being ADHD together. We laugh about the same things we do. How many times have we deleted our computer, our phone, our email list? And it, how many times have we flooded somebody's house that wasn't our own <laughs> by accident? How many times, you know, like all those stupid stories or it's like, I totally forgot. I, I impulsively pushed a button, you know, it, it, all these things that, that we recognize in each other, it's love. That's what love is, is recognizing how human we are together. And it's just wonderful to be with people of your tribe for that reason. It, it, going to any Chad group or to, to some of your groups, and you can see that, is that people walk out saying, you know, I am just wired differently and that's okay. And even that fear of saying, I'm not good at this yet, and that's okay. I'm not, uh, I'm not there yet. Just that acceptance. You have somebody else that can recognize and accept you as human. And that's beautiful. So tell us where clients, uh, people can get in touch with you and um, maybe something you'd like to offer them if they click on your website or the link below this video. Absolutely. So you can reach me and see, uh, see me at progressivegrowthcoaching.com. And a, a gift I have is six ways to execute like an executive.
And this is about executive functioning and pulling out what CEOs do and their magic tricks to getting to the top and, and delegating and utilizing different resources so that we can up our game in business and in life. Okay, well, thank you very much, Evan. It was a pleasure to meet you and to talk with you and to be vulnerable a little bit with you. <laughs> um, so thank you very much and uh, we'll be in touch. My Take pleasure, care. George. Bye. Talk soon. Bye-bye.